So, yes, um, we just uh, learned two new things in uh, uh, morphology. One is the infixation, which is um, not really widely available in many of the world's languages. And the second one is um, bound bees. So, uh, those who have studied linguistics before, you might be aware about it. And if you are a newcomer and, you, and this is the first course that is uh, that you are registered in the discipline called linguistics, then obviously these two are the new things. Taking this newness forward or, or trying to understand what are the or trying to explore what are the possible um, new things available in morphology, um, I am going to talk about or we are going to discuss um, a phenomenon called neologism. So, neologism as a word it means creation of new words. So, broadly it covers the domain of creation of new words, but eventually you may, um, you may also consider the changing of meaning of words that is also uh, coming under the category of creation of like in, in the category of neologism. So, two things either you are adding new words or you are changing the meaning of the already existing words. In both ways, the process is called as neologism. I okay? am um, sure um, if, you, if you think about it in a, uh, for, a, for a while in your own language, you might have noticed that uh, new words have been a part of it, old words have been deleted and there are certain words whose meanings have been uh, broadened or it has been narrowed down. Okay? So, that is what we, uh, we understand when I say neologism. How many of you have um, heard the term uh, like the new new generation words like lit? Lit as a word, it does not uh, for me probably it will be um, the past tense of light, but then uh, when you when you consider uh, lit as a word uh, for a new generation user, lit means something great, something wonderful, something fantastic. So, this is a new word which has entered into, this is not a new word that has been entered into the English lexicon, rather an existing word, the past tense of light has been changed to, um, changed to lit. Okay? Uh, so, lit is no more just the past tense of the word, rather it has been broadened, the scope of the meaning of lit has been broadened to include quite a few other um, words too, like quite a few other meanings. For example, I have already told okay, the things like great, wonderful, fantastic and uh, uh, words like that. Okay. Yeah. So, now uh, I am going to talk about a couple of uh, phenomena which are going to be or which are always a part of neologism. So, when I say neologism, uh, our concern is to figure out what are the different ways by which uh, new words are being created or the existing words they change their meaning. Okay? So, let us start it from the first point that is the coined words. There are certain words which have been coined, which has been newly framed or formulated. One such word is geek. How many of you think you know the meaning of the word geek and what kind of interpretation do you have when you utter the word like geek? Um, if you check the dictionary, um, the meaning of geek is somebody who just reads, who, who has only who has only been interested in reading and academic stuff. It is not really a fun loving person, quite boring and then uh, does not like to does not like to socialize with people, does not like to be uh, found um, with the friends. All the time, the, the only favorite work that he has is reading and primarily uh, the geeky type people are good in uh, academia, they are also considered to be brilliant. So, these are the, uh, this is a word which was not a part of English lexicon for a, like this is a new word which has been introduced to English lexicon in the late um, 18th century I think. So, geek um, is a coined word. So, somebody who is less attractive only into his reading books and academic stuff, does not socialize, also does not have many friends this kind of a person would be known as geek. So, um, these uh, um, so the words like the words like this they have been recently added to the lexicon. Then there is another uh, form, there is another way by which um, 
acronyms are like by which new words are formed is acronymization. There is a word, uh, the, the second form or the second way by which we, uh, we create or we, we consider neologism as a part is acronyms. Acronyms are formed by a process called acronymization. So, when you say acronymization that means you are primarily what you are doing, you are um, taking the first letter of each word and you are producing it as a unit. So, let us let us let me give you an example um, like LAN. So, LAN is a word, this is an acronym of a bigger word local area network. So, when you say local area network, um, instead of saying L A N, we call it LAN. Similar is the case with WAN, WAN would be wide area network. Then we have uh, words like let us say, um, let us say AIMS. AIMS is a um, is an institute, a medical institute, and what is what is the full form of it? All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So that will be um, that will be AIMS. So uh, all these words, AIMS or or LAN or WAN or for that matter, let's say um, the words like Brexit for that matter. So these are the ones which are considered to be acronymization. Um, why it would be um, what we are doing, we are we are picking up the first word, sorry, the first letter from each word in a bigger one. So instead of saying local, we have taken L, area we have taken A, and uh, uh, network we have taken N. So, but what we are doing here, we are reading it as a unit. We are not reading it independently. We are not saying L A N instead of that. We are saying LAN. So, when you consider LAN as LAN as a whole unit, like as one unit, then it will be considered as acronym. But if you instead of uh, reading it as a unit or instead of using it as a unit, if you are using it as letter by letter, then it will be alph alphabetic abbreviation. So, the next category, check the slides here. So, the next category is alphabetic abbreviation. So, alphabetic abbreviation means you are you are actually pronouncing each alpha like each letter given over there. So, the example that I have given here is HTML. So, what is HT? Hypertext markup language. So, that is a computer related word. So, instead of reading the entire uh, uh, entire hypertext markup language, we are simply saying HTML. But HTML, we do not read it as a as a as a whole unit. We read we we utter each letter. H, T, M and L. So, that is why this will be alphabetic abbreviation. On the other hand, local area network read as LAN would be an acronym. But remember in both cases, the new words whether it is acronymization or abbreviation, the new words have been made a part of the um, English lexicon by, um, by kind of shortening it. So, in one way uh, like the first uh, shortening is acronymization where you are reading the word as a unit. The second one is also shortening it, but you are not reading it as a unit rather you are, read, uh, you are reading it as distinct letter. So, then it is going to be HTML. The next method by which we create new words or neologism uh, happens is, the, is clippings. So, when you say clippings what you are doing you are basically trying to cut it. It is a bigger word and you are taking just a part of it then you call it clipping. The example given here is doctor. So, when you say doctor, we are just we are not writing D O C T O R, rather we are just using a clipping of it and uh, we will simply just put D R full stop. Similar is the case when, when you address a professor as prof. So, when you say prof, that means you are uh, the full uh, spelling is P R O F E W S O R, but instead of writing the entire word, you are just cutting it and then you are keeping one part over there. So, prof. So, professor to prof, prof is, a, is an instance of clipping, doctor to dr is also an instance of clipping. Think about more instances of clipping in English as well as in your language. Then I am going to talk about a very interesting phenomenon called blending or blends. Blending you can also call it as a process. So, when you say blending, what should it mean? What is what, what is the word blending, um, what does it tell you? 
as a hearer when you hear the word blend what kind of information do you, do you get so blending means mixing things together so all of us we use blenders at our respective houses so when we put a lot of things together and we are blending it or we are mixing it we call it um, that 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 is the process is called blending Simil something similar um, is also happening in uh, morphology so what happens in morphology um, you take half of one word half of the other word and you put it together and you make it a new word the example is infotainment so uh, what is the meaning of infotainment all of us those who have the uh, tv um, channel like the smart TVs at home, you must have the infotainment channels. So infotainment is a word which has contents like information as well as entertainment. So part of information is taken that is info, then the rest the part of entertainment that is tenment. So keeping both information plus ent entertainment, we have got a blend, uh, blending word or blended word rather that is infotainment. So this is also a new way by which we can add new words to English lexicon. For that matter, we can words to uh, we can add words to any uh, given language. Then we have generified words. So generified words is a, it's it's also a very interesting phenomenon in neologism. So generified words. Um, the best example I can give Xerox. So tell me how many of you actually. Um, kind of say that I am going to photocopy my document. We do not say that. We say, oh, I am going to Xerox my document. But do you know Xerox is the name of a photocopier machine that became a generified term? So, this brand became so popular that people associated it with photocopying. This has become synonymous to photocopying. So, if you want to say I want to photocopy my document instead of that, you can simply say I want to Xerox my document. So, this Xerox has become a generified word. Then there is another phenomenon by which we can uh, we can use like we can have neologism that is proper nouns and the proper nouns sometimes what happens a particular thing which has been uh, named by a particular person like named um, after a particular person becomes a generic like becomes a common noun. Um, the example given here is guillotine. Guillotine is a machine uh, which was used or which was yeah which, which was actually used during the French Revolution for the execution of the royal family, French royal family. So guillotine was invented by Dr. Guillotine. So Dr. Guillotine is the inventor of this machine. However, this particular execution machine became synonymous with the name of like became synonymous um, with the word like like with it has been named after its inventor. So instead of giving it a name or calling it an execution machine, people started calling it as uh, as guillotine. So guillotine has been named after its inventor, but it became a word. It became a new word in English lexicon. So a proper noun which is guillotine has been converted into a common noun. Then um, considering language is dynamic and language is interesting, we can also see uh, a lot of borrowing from other languages. So when you borrow, um, either you borrow it directly or you do it indirectly. So direct borrowing is uh, something when you are just getting the word from the other language and you are using it as it is. Uh, for example, kindergarten. Kindergarten is a German word uh, that means primary school like the pre-primary schools or nursery schools you can say. So uh, the Britishers or the English people they got it from uh, German lexicon, but what they did they did not try to change it that they, they used it the way they got it from it from, uh, from the Germans. So um, kindergarten though it is it's not an English word to begin with it became a part of um, English lexicon gradually. So, this is called direct borrowing. Then there is something called indirect borrowing. So, in case of indirect borrowing, um, a word like alcohol, alcohol literally means fire water. So, water which has fire that is going to be called as um, called as alcohol. So, these are the native American languages or the nat sorry, native American words, um, a railroad, a railroad literally means iron horse 
in the Native American languages and it gradually became a part of English lexicon also. So, um, alcohol meaning uh, fire water and uh, a railroad, railroad meaning iron horse, these are all instances of indirect borrowing. So, what the English people have done, they have not really um, used directly their the directly languages from other words, sorry directly words from other languages, rather what they have done, they have borrowed the words, but instead of using it um, as it is, they have tried to tweak it for their own benefit. So, these are the different ways by which, um, these are some of the ways, that does not mean that these are the only ways available for the creation of new words. These are just uh, a few processes, some of the words which you can, um, which you which you should notice when you are trying to understand neologism. So, uh, let us look at it, um, let us just scan through what all we have discussed. To begin like to wind it up, uh, this particular um, unit like this particular subunit called neologism, it is a process by which new words can be added to the lexicon or the meaning of already existing words can be changed. I hope all of you remember this. So, there are two ways, one you are adding new words, the other you are changing the meaning. So, I am going to talk about primarily the addition of new words here, how the how uh, what are the different processes by which uh, new words get added to the English lexicon and these are a few instances by coining, by acronymizing, by abbreviating, by clipping, by blending, by generifying words, by making uh, proper nouns. Uh, like by using proper nouns as common, common noun based words, by direct borrowing and by indirect borrowing and then the examples I have already discussed. My suggestion for my, uh, for, for the participants would be, please make sure you understand the process as well and try to add as many other English words as possible plus try to extend it to your own first language. Do you think all the processes that I have discussed here are available in your language. What do you think about it? I, I, do you think this is how we work or do you think this is how um, our languages work? This is how we also add uh, words or we also change the meanings of our words in our own, uh, in our own first language. So, think about it and then uh, you might get assignments to do on the basis of such, such processes of neologism. Okay. So, now let us have a look at it, uh, how the meaning of the words have changed. The previous discussion was primarily about how the new words are created and now we are going to talk about how the meaning has been changed. Um, the change might happen at different level, the change might happen at the grammatical category level, it might happen at the vocabulary level. And I was also talking about semantic, bro, uh, sem semantic bro, uh, sorry, uh, broadening and also narrowing, then there is semantic drift and then there is reversal. So, these are the different ways by which the meaning of an existing word might change. So, let us go about it one by one. What is the first one? The first one is change in the grammatical category. Um, I would like you to, um, to look at this word. ponytail, right. So, generally this is used as a noun, the little uh, ponytail that we, that the little girls they, um, it is a kind of particular hairstyle uh, which is known as ponytail. But you notice that this particular word has been also used as a verb here. So, when I say I wanted to ponytail her hair, that means this is, this has been uh, or this is working as a, um, as a infinitival form, right. It is in the two form, the two infinitival form, which is, which is actually treated like a verb. I can also say, I, I, I can also say I ponytailed her hair, which sounds a little weird, but you will be surprised to know that such kind of usages are not impossible or are not. Um, and it is it's not uh, rare to find. There are quite a few instances where people do use such constructions, I ponytailed her hair. So, the grammatical category of the word ponytail which used to be a noun, it has become changed to a verb. Okay? So, this is one way by which the meaning of the word changes. Then we are coming to the, dom uh, to the domain uh, 
extension of a vocabulary. A vocabulary it used to be a part of one domain and now it has become a part of the other domain. So, um, in this case we will uh, we will check ship and captain. So, ship and captain um, they were used to be related to only. So, there was a time when captain means it was related to only the, the domain of ship. So, a captain can only belong to a ship. You cannot say um, the captain of the team that was not really a word which was used before. So, now what happens a team also has a captain, a flight also has a captain, a ship also has a captain. Even sometimes we also say oh my god my father is the captain of our family. So, this is a metaphorical extension. So, the word captain has moved or like has broadened uh, its um, its domain of it has broad, broadened its domain as a um, as an as a vocabulary. So, uh, it is the extension of the domain as a vocabulary is also coming under the category of changing the meaning of a word. So, ship and captain they are not exclusively available to each other rather the word captain has been used in multiple dimensions nowadays. So, uh, as the examples I have just given. So, house captain is also um, a familiar term that we encounter nowadays. Okay. Then the third form is broadening. So, when you say broadening the meaning of a particular word has become so wide that it can actually accommodate a lot of other sub meanings. Let us say cool cool is a word which is uh, which has almost like a pet word in the new generation uh, like among the new generation speakers. So, everything they find good, everything they find interesting, easy, wonderful they are going to use the word cool. This dress is cool, the subject is cool, I hope this subject is cool, I do not know the, uh, the participants would let me know later. Uh, they can also say um, this place is cool, this uh, let us say this classroom is cool. So, cool as a word it is not related to only temperature anymore. When uh, or in the in the olden days cool would only restrict itself to um, to the to the temperature re temperature related information. If a, if the temperature is a little low then we are going to call it cool, but now cool means it can actually in include any kind of things. And I just gave you the examples how it can extend to a classroom, to a course, to a dress, to a place, to a building, to literally everything. Then uh, the other example I am going to give which is just diametrically opposite. In case of cool it has sh it has uh, shifted from a narrow to broader broadened domain, but in case of narrowing the meaning used to be quite wide, but now it has become short like it has become narrow. Um, for example, girl uh, used to include all the women like anybody who is a female gender could be include could be considered as a girl, but now girl as a word it is generally restricted to the younger girls. We do not really associate uh, associate the word girl with uh, with a senior citizen for that matter. But there was a time if it is a senior citizen if, if she is a senior citizen too she might be uh, addressed as a girl, but now the meaning of girl has been narrowed down from any female gender it has come back to younger females or it has it has come back to like yeah the young basically the younger females are going to be called as girl now. Similar is the case with art. So, art used to include all kinds of disciplines even science was also an art even mathematics was also an art, but now art has been its limited uh, semantic uh, interpretation or it has its limited semantic um, uh, semantic detailing. So, it does not include uh, the science subjects anymore. So, art has narrowed down to the meaning of only art. Then the third uh, um, then the third process is semantic drift. So, the semantic drift means the meaning of a particular particular uh, word has been drifted to uh, or has been shifted to another domain. Let us uh, look at the word uh, lady. So, when it is lady uh, this is this has <coughs> mainly come from two words one is uh, um, half which is which is like bread half means bread and uh, 
dighe which means kneader. So, somebody who would knead a bread or somebody whose work is kneading the bread would be known as lady. But see now how the, how the, shema, how the semantic drift has happened. So, now lady means somebody who belongs to um, maybe um, an elite society or aristocratic family um, who is who belongs to a well of family uh, for that matter. So, lady does not associate itself with bread needers anymore rather its form has been elevated. We do not uh, like lady has a certain context of her dress and generally it refers to women from the well of educated aristocrat families. So, there has been a shift and what kind of a sh what kind of a shift? There is a semantic uh, drift or semantic shift ok from uh, from kneading the bread to maybe participating in the boardroom description sorry boardroom discussion. So, that is how it has become um, semantic drift. Then there is also another the final process here uh, in the changing of the word uh, what we call rehearsals sorry reversals. So, reversals means um, there are two different uh, like there are two different words which were used in one way like in one form in the earlier days and another form in the in the um, recent days. Square deal as a word it was used in 1930s and 40s, but the same word has been reversed to square one in 1950s. So, the meaning basically remains same, but then uh, the, the form of the word had changed it used to be considered as square deal and now it is considered as square one. So, these are a few instances of um, changing the meaning of a word. So, in the previous slide we saw how the new words are introduced and in this slide we saw how the meanings are changed. So, now um, I will I um, will try to I uh, will try to give you some idea um, that what are the different processes by which you actually um, you actually create or you actually uh, sort of form new words or even the um, even the existing words how you are changing it. So, there are two different processes by which uh, the words are formed. So, that is what we call word formation rules. So, the words can be uh, formed by adding two different nouns. So, these are the different formula um, have a look at it. So, when you have noun plus noun you can um, you would uh, you would basically get words like landlord. So, when you say land and lord both are nouns. There could be um, word derivation rules something like adjective plus noun. So, in this case there would be the adjective is high and uh, chair is noun. So, high chair is an adjective plus noun word. Then you have overdose, overdose is what is the formula preposition plus noun. So, over is the preposition, dose is the noun. Then you have verb plus noun go karting. So, go kart when you say uh, go is, is, is the verb and cart could be the noun. Then the next uh, rule is adjective plus adjective red hot when you say oh that is a red hot um, show. So, when you say red hot it is very attractive smart um, both are adjectives you also have red which is an adjective then there is hot that is also adjective right. Then you have noun plus adjective that means sky blue, sky is a noun and blue is the adjective. And the finally, derivational rule or the word formation rule would be preposition plus verb. So, over C, over is the preposition and C is the verb right. So, these are the different ways by which you can actually create new words. So, when you create new words like this we will find out whether these are uh, complex words or these are compound words. If you remember uh, what we discussed before, uh, the complex words are going to be combination of two free morphemes and compound words are going to be one free morpheme and one bound morpheme. So, considering all these words landlord, high chair, overdose, go kart, red hot, sky blue and over sea, all the morphemes found here are free morphemes and because of the free morphemes that they are here words are compound words. But my question for you would be do you think compound words are limited to two words or it can be more than that. So, think about it you might get it as an assignment later. And then the other question that I want you to, um, uh, to 
think about or to figure out is is um, is there any word which does not have a head. Let us say whether it is a <coughs> compl com complex word or a compound word there must be a head word. So, this head word would eventually um, would eventually be considered as the as the most important part of the word. So, when you say um, let us say teacher, so there must be a head word can you can you tell me what is the head word here? The head word is teach E R is the morpheme. So, in this case when you say um, landlord there must be a head word what do you think which one is the uh, which one is the head word and which one is the tail word for that matter high chair which is the head word which is the uh, which is the um, maybe the tail word. So, when you say high chair the chair is mainly the head word because you are talking about a chair whether it is high whether it is low whether it is to, uh, whether it is tall or short that um, that will decide um, the nature of the chair. So, the, the head word is chair um, landlord uh, so, lord of what lord of the uh, lord of the land. So, lord is the um, uh, is the uh, head word right overdose dose is the head word go kart it is a little tricky to find out which one is head which one is not the head a uh, red hot the same thing which one is the head word which one is is the which one is not the head word that is also a little tricky to understand. So, I want you to remember these questions and to think about it not only uh, from the context of English but also from the context of your own first language. So, what are the questions? First, do you think compound words are limited to only two words or you can add more than that? Second, do you think all headless um, sorry do you think all compound words will have a head or there are instances where there is no um, head in a compound word. So, think about it and then we will uh, meet again in the next session of morphology until then thank you.